Today, I talked to Rachel Siegel, aka Crypto Finally, on the Speaking of Crypto podcast. This is podcast number five for our Women in Crypto Wednesday series. I'm your host, Shannon Grinnell. Okay, great. Rachel, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Really happy to be talking to you. Thank you. No, I'm happy to be here. Well, why don't we start with some background? So I thought um, if you can just tell me how you got into Bitcoin and crypto and then what your educational and career path has been. So uh, Bitcoin and crypto, I actually got into because I have a background in mainstream media production. So I used to work for the Blue Man Group, HPE, Weight Watchers, um, and several Broadway shows. I had friends who worked in mainstream production out in Los Angeles. So they actually came to New York for consensus um, and sort of just for shits and giggles, invited me out to the networking parties. I started to get to know people in the cryptocurrency community. um, And I found that it was just great people, really driven, hardworking, and actually trying to aim to do something larger. Um, After that, I started working with their cryptocurrency YouTube channel um, and sort of allotting those production skills into the crypto world. So Rachel, can you explain to me now, are you a digital nomad? Are you kind of roaming from place to place? Yes. So I actually, I gave up my apartment in New York City uh, on May 1st. So I have been more or less living out of a suitcase, going conference to conference, uh, meeting people in the crypto community since that time. Um, It's been quite a few months now. Uh, I guess that it is officially September. um, And it kind of has not hit me uh, the length of time that I've been doing this. But yes, I have been completely digitally nomadic, um, going and meeting more people in the community wherever I'm going. Uh, And I've just been really enjoying it and finding that people who are involved in this really are great people um, Mm -hmm. and people that I wouldn't have had the chance to meet otherwise. Yeah. Now, was that a goal of yours? Have you been trying to get to that point where you could sort of live on the road and go from place to place? Well, it's funny. uh, When I was a younger. Um, So initially when I got into production, I was a playwright. Um, Mm -hmm. And I remember saying when I was like 18 years old that I wanted to be a nomadic playwright. I wanted to go around and create stories in different locations and not necessarily have one place. So it might have been something that subconsciously has been back with me. Um, But for the most part, I really just enjoy new settings, um, Mm -hmm. new people, and honestly, a lot of the same people. That's really what's been so fantastic about this specific community is wherever I go, I have this same group of friends who inevitably shows up in that location. Um, Yeah, it's cool. I found that with production as well, that you tended to go from one film to the next to the next with your same sort of crew. Um, And then it was almost like going to camp every day because you're like hanging out with the same people. You all eat together, you know, and I think conferences are probably like that as well. Yeah. I, um, I was watching a television show recently where they portrayed one of those, you know, beautiful high schools with the big fields and the little cliques and stuff. And one of my friends said to me, wow, that reminds me so much of high school. Um, I went to a very, very small public high school in New York City. That portrayal does not remind me of high school at all, but it does kind of remind me of what we have going on here. Hmm. Um, you know, we are sort of this one campus that would be cryptocurrency, that would be something like crypto Twitter or YouTube. We all know each other from there and we congregate. And I just think it's really beautiful that we've been able to accomplish that. Yeah, and do you see different clicks in crypto Twitter and crypto Uh community? Yeah, I, I would say so. I would say that we we do have some clicking issues, um, but I think more that we grow, um, the more that we expand, the more demographics that we get involved, uh, the more different kinds of people, the less of that that we will see. Hmm. Um, and I wanted to get back to you being in this digital nomad. Like, how do you how do you make it work? How do you earn an income? Um. A variety of different ways um, through my platform, through speaking, uh, through educational videos. I also make animated videos, uh, explainers, and how tos um, for blockchain companies. So basically, finding new ways uh, that we can expand and expose people to cryptocurrency in a creative format that may not have necessarily been around. Um, And that's where I really bring my production background. So something that I do is I take white papers for companies, I break them down, um, and I make a short animation that explains a white paper um, because not everybody is going to have the brain to understand a white paper, and that's okay. We can't expect them to. So, and visual understanding is like usually a lot clearer, and it stays with you longer, right? Absolutely. 
capacity. Absolutely. And I think that we really have a need for that as a lot of the community thus far, we're on the beginning of a new wave. It is an emerging technology, but a lot of the people who are involved right now do understand uh, reading a white paper. They do understand watching a graph. Um, and there's just uh, needs to be room for people who might not have that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're making it work. You actually can, you know, pay for where you're staying or someone's paying for where you're staying and you're making enough money to live. So you've managed to sort of create a career that allows you to go from place to place. Yes, I am surviving. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, well, I wanted to get into something fairly controversial. And one of your tweets recently was about being a keynote speaker and also posting bikini pics on Twitter. It says, stop talking shit and get on this level. We can be whoever we want to be. That's the magic of crypto. Um, so can you tell me why you felt like you needed to post this? I see um, a lot of the climate that goes on on crypto Twitter. Um, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of people telling each other what is right for crypto. Uh, what is the right portrayal? What is the right type of person that should be here? And what's the wrong type of person for the space? Um, initially, when I posted that, what I'm trying to really say is that we need to be inclusive to all sorts of people and how they're going to behave. Um, so long as we stick within this one grain, this one demographic that acts the same way, there isn't a uh, opportunity for us to grow. And I just think that it's important to be supportive of each other. Um, and, you know, not let things like Twitter selfies uh, stop you from trying to understand a person. Yeah. So um, do you think that you, there's a lot of people who, I guess, were pushing back against the kinds of pictures you were posting or the kind of tweets that you were posting to basically say that you shouldn't be one of those people who are representative of crypto and Bitcoin? I mean, absolutely. Um, it, it's hit different waves. You know, I, I like to call uh, crypto Twitter the climate and the weather. Um, mm -hmm. In this specific instance, you know, the weather was bad and my umbrella wasn't big enough. Um, <laughs> right. But, Hard because of because of the bikini pictures is that what do you think caused the big backlash or this um, I, fury I say, and you know there are going to be a lot of people who disagree with me about this but i think that there is a lack of representation for women in the space now i'm not saying that every woman in the space needs to be out there posting selfies or bikini pictures however there is a sort of misstep when it comes to the way that we perceive and portray them now I am of the firm belief that I can post a photo in a bikini without it being inherently sexual. Me in my body is not an inherent sexual object. However, the fact that there are so many men and so many people who might not have been exposed to this concept that I'm allowed to live in my own body and I'm allowed to represent my own body how I want to, um, people calling my, my selfies of my face where I'm fully dressed erotic. Um, it's really far from what's actually happening. And I think that we really need to open a door to understand that women can exist. They can exist within their own bodies. They can dress themselves how they please. And that does not necessarily make them an inherent sexual object for you to look at or to comment upon. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by this concept because um, you also posted uh, a question, which is, why is everyone so triggered by me? And I think there are a lot of people triggered. And so I wanted to dig into it a little bit further. So just in, in terms of what you said about posting a picture of you in a bikini and how it's not necessarily sexual, I come from a background where I was playing competitive beach volleyball and our uniform is a bikini. And I didn't it wasn't a sexual act. We were competing and um, we were in bikinis just because it's bloody hot out there. Um, and it just what, work, what works best for the sport. Um, but there were guys out there taking pictures, especially when we're, you know, bent over and, you know, whatnot. So, um, but do you think this is the same thing? What you're posting, you know, you in a bikini, do you see it as very sort of neutral and you just representing your body or is there something sexual behind it? I think that the neutrality that we need to be able to view is distinguishing the difference between a woman who is taking photos of herself representing the way that she is willing to be seen versus something like a booth babe. Um, I am not 
pro booth babe. The fact that I wear different clothing than you might normally see in the crypto community doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of sexualizing women in order to get attention, in order to market. Um, there has to be room for us to say that we are human beings and we can choose what we do for ourselves. Um, so that's more or less the stance that I take on the subject, which is a major corporation isn't telling me that I need to wear that. Um, that I might view as wrong. I might view it, you know, if I'm being employed and you're telling me that I'm not able to be employed by you unless I wear this outfit, I find something to be wrong with that. Um, because we should have the choice and the opportunity to do what we want to do. But I inherently in existence um, don't view it as sexualizing myself and don't necessarily view it much more than that. Um, I was having fun. I was in Florida. I was at a pool. Um, right. You know, I wasn't just like putting on a bikini and taking a picture. I, I was having a summer vacation. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're if you're posting everyday sort of lifestyle photos and this is part of your lifestyle, I can see um, where that would sort of fit in. There's the context, right? Um, I guess um, I also have had an experience where in my early 20s, I met a friend of a friend and she was a feminist stripper. So she was stripping in order to pay for university and she just felt like it was empowering for her. She, her stance was, if guys are going to be dumb enough to pay me money to take off my clothes, then why not? And it was revolutionary for me to sort of think that you know, this was someone who was a really strong personality, who knew what she wanted, knew how to get things using her body. But I think she saw it from a feminist point of view because she was making the choice herself. Um, yes. So you're sort of bringing up the point where nobody's telling you to dress a certain way. So you're choosing to do that. Is that in itself empowering and, and feminist in a way? I think that the real root of feminism would be allowing women to be whoever they want to be without attempting to cast judgment over them for it. So it might not necessarily have to do with the outfit. It might not necessarily have to do with what our platforms are. The point is that women should be able to create their own platform. Women should be able to say what they want to say and do what they want to do. I'm not breaking any laws. I'm not uh, committing any crimes. Um, and really the truth of the internet is that if you're not looking, it's like it's not even there. Hmm. Um, so people get to make this choice for themselves. They really get to decide, you know, is this something that I'm engaging with or not? But I feel like when there's an extreme backlash, when there's an extreme pushback, um, we're really starting to guide the space in a bad direction. Um, we can't put down uh, new people who want to get involved. We can't put down different types of people who want to get involved and still continue on with this myth that we want to grow the space. Um, you don't want to grow the space if you only want to see yourself in the room. That is not growth. Yeah, so you're you're pairing your, um, your keynote or your talk with being able to put on a bikini at the same time. And um, so is your stance that you can be sexual or attractive um, as a woman and also like be taken seriously or, you know, be intelligent or that you have all these facets to you? Is that what you're trying to put out there? What the main point of what I'm trying to say is I am allowed to live in the body that I live in. I'm allowed to portray myself in the body that I live in. And that should not affect the work that I do in the space. It should not be the main focus on what I do in the space. Um, and I just think that that's really what's important to hold on to is we can do what we want to do. Um, and we can be different kinds of people, you know? Um, and the fact that it's different for people, you know, it, it it shouldn't be. Uh, and I know that it is, but someone I feel needs to come out and say, Hey, we're allowed to be who we want to be. Mm -hmm. And what has been the response? I, I can't even keep track of all of it, to be honest with you. Um, it's uh, outrageous. Uh, men deciding that I'm doing something for a certain reason, men putting their uh, perspective upon it, you know, and really the whole point, I, 
people read the tweet wrong. People read like, get on this level, like everyone should like be sexy. No, it, it's get on this level and allow yourself to be who you're going to be, despite the climate, despite the weather, despite what people might have to say about it, you know, stick to your guns, be yourself. Um, so do you think there's any part of you that's doing it for, um, for more likes or if you're getting paid to, to post content or to have more followers, is there some, what would you say to someone who's saying it's very opportunistic, what you're putting out there? I would say that I'm confident with myself and that a lot of people have struggled with a lot of things over time and that you do not know a person through a selfie on Twitter. (laughs) <laughs> that's interesting um and would you be presenting yourself in the same way are you are you single Rachel or do you would you care to answer that um that's a strange I uh, if you're, <laughs> I was wondering if versus if you were married I, I, or be, no I have a really good answer to that uh yeah. Crypto NDO actually came out with a video a couple months back where she talked about women in selfies and she said explicitly within that video that she has a husband And because she has a husband, and I quote, because I have a husband, I'm not going to be out there putting these types of photos of myself. I um, disagree with that. Hmm. So if that's the direction you're taking this question, um, I would say that my relationship status does not have an effect on the way that I wish to portray myself, nor do I wish to be in a relationship with somebody Mm -hmm. who would try and micromanage um who i'm trying to be you know it's it's one thing to post a video uh, a picture or a video of yourself an innocent one at that um you know there's porn on twitter everywhere and people are caught up in my smiling videos um but someone who tries to micromanage your actions in which when they're not harmful to you in the first place. You know, cheating is one thing. Um, Lying to your significant other is one thing. But posting a selfie of yourself, really, um, at the end of the day, should not affect what you have going on in your own life. And it doesn't. And I I don't think that the stance that, you know, um, you're with somebody should affect the way that you are representing and portraying yourself. You know, I'm not looking to have a keeper. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I just, I think it's so interesting because um, there, it may come down to intent. If the intent is to attract a whole bunch of men or men's attention or, you know, sexual attention, then maybe that's a different, a different thing than um, what you're saying you're putting across, which is this is me and, you know, this is what I look like and I am who I am. And you're trying to sort of leave it at that, I think. Is that, does that sound right? My, my, my larger point would be that, you know, most of the selfies that I post on myself, most of these uh, small videos of my face um, are not inherently sexual. They are not sexual things Thus, I'm not viewing it as a way to get sexual attention. That would be the gaze that's put upon them. Okay, you don't think that they're sexual because you... They're not. (laughs) Because they're not. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't... The way, the reason that you feel like they're sexual is the way that mainstream media has conditioned you to look at women. Hmm. It's an interesting take. Um... You know, you've done things like, you know, playing with your hair or putting something in your mouth, wearing lipstick, you know, having your nails all done. Those are more sexual. They're sexualized. You're right, I think, through mainstream media. They're sexualized. They're they're not inherently sexual. That's interesting. So your take is that what you're putting out there isn't sort of a sexual, I guess, invitation or, you know, in, in... some sort of way it's more neutral I, like you're saying like the comments on my nails i i've done my nails like this uh for 10 years you know these are my real nails as well these mm-hmm. are not fake nails um <laughs> these are my real nails um and you know the fact that that's the focus at all is is upsetting that's the fact interesting that that's yeah picked up on it's interesting so I guess here's my question. So I'm a mom, I have teenage boys and a little girl. So I think I would, you know, I come at it from, from that lens, I guess. 
Um, and, and I guess, you know, I, when I look at it, uh, first of all, I think it's empowering to be able to say, look at me, I'm sexy, I'm intelligent, I'm all of these things. I'm like the whole package and just be out there. And I also come from a generation where we had Madonna and she was out there, you know, breaking down barriers and, you know, showing this sexualized version of herself. Meanwhile, she's this, you know, hardcore businesswoman who is extremely successful. Um, so I think those two things can coexist. Um, I have to ask myself personally, is that something if I were younger and had a kick-ass body, you know, would I be putting myself out into the world with a bikini? And I guess my answer is, you know, I have my pictures of me in a bikini on my personal Facebook um, when I was water skiing, let's say, and I've kept that personal and not sort of put it out in the world. And I think just because it feels intimate to me, and I guess that's where I sort of have drawn my line. Um, but I also think about, well, what about my, my teenage boys seeing pictures of other women or even if it were myself out there in a bikini or, and how would I want my daughter, what would I want her thinking to be when she's older? Um, what are your thoughts on that? My immediate two cents would be that that's not a conversation for your daughter. That's a conversation for your son. Mm, and what do you mean by that? What's the conversation? Like the conversation is just, you know, we, people are people. Um, the, the way that you view it is the way that you view it. The way that you interpret it is the way that you choose to interpret it. Now, there are many di different interpretations that can be taken. The fact that people are, are stuck on the sexualized one is a conversation that needs to be had. Hmm. It's really interesting. So you think it's um, really eye is in the, or beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or the context is in the eye of the beholder in this case? Hmm. I really do. I think that that's the most important thing that I'm saying, um, which is, and you know, like, let's, let's take it on a broader uh, scale than what I'm doing. Let's think about uh, the fact that, and this is true, uh, whether people want to believe it or not, the majority of women who are currently in cryptocurrency are sex workers. Now, there are lots and lots of women who are not sex workers who work in crypto. They're amazing. They do what they do. They build on the blockchain, you know, but the majority of women who have gotten involved in crypto are sex workers. And that's something that we cannot ignore. Um, we cannot put down that entire demographic of people who are helping us build, helping us grow as a space demographically and more, um, we can't just say that we do not accept them. Um, and that's much larger than just a selfie. And if people are willing to put down a selfie and have people, you know, isolated from the space over a selfie, what are we saying about this large collection of women who actually are involved in cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. And what's your take on female sex workers? Your, um, how do you feel about, you know, you think that they should be long and, you know, anything else, you're not judging them. No, no. I, I don't see any reason to judge them. And uh, to any of the men who are judging the sex workers, I would question how much porn you watch. Um, <laughs> You know, That's like funny. on some level, you need to accept that they're there and they're providing you with a service. Um, and that's exactly what it is. They're providing you with a service. Hmm. Okay. Well, love chatting with you about this. I mean, it's really, I think it's an important topic. I think we should keep the discussion open and keep it going. Um, but I also wanted to talk to you about your thoughts on crypto and Bitcoin. <laughs> so um, what, you know, why are you here? What is it about Bitcoin that you really inspired you to become a part of this space? And what's exciting to you about cryptocurrency? I, I honestly just think the technology um, and the direction that we are moving in the space, uh, the way that we are becoming more mainstream and the way that we are growing, um, it's an opportunity unlike any other one that I have had in my time and very well might be the last. To me, it really is the new internet. Um, it is the new social media, the new radio. Um, and this sort of wave is going to be unstoppable. And having the opportunity to get in on the ground floor um, is just something that I would not have given up for the world. Yeah. And so what's your main goal? You're, um, you know, uh, you founded your own company. You are a crypto Twitter influencer. Is it mass adoption that you is sort of your main focus? 
Um, yes, is uh, the demographic expansion of the space. And the way that I, I gear that focus is through mainstream media portrayal of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, how does the outside public who does not have exposure become exposed to the fact that it exists? Um, and that's a question that I think a lot of people should be asking themselves. You know, we have technology, we have user interface, but we need accessibility and distribution. There needs to be a way to say to people off the street who have no idea that Bitcoin exists, hey, this is something you might be interested in. Um, for me, before my friends invited me to go out to consensus, uh, before I met the people in the community, I had zero exposure. I didn't know that cryptocurrency existed at all. And that's not to say that I would not have invested in Bitcoin a long time ago. I thought it was something impossible that I would never be able to figure out. Um, and that's just due to lack of exposure. So I think it's really important that we find new ways to get more people involved. And you know what? That plays directly into what's going on on Twitter. Um, a lot of it isn't accessible. A lot of it needs to become accessible. We need to let people know, hey, uh, there is a space for you, whoever you want to be. You don't necessarily need to be an anonymous avatar who's charting for you to be a part of the space. You know, uh, there's a lot of people who will never understand that TA or those charts. Um, but that doesn't mean we do not need them. Yeah. So what's the, I guess, how do you do it? How do you get, how do you break through and get into like normie Twitter and, you know, the outside world and, and have more people interested? I think it's really the growth of the portrayal and the type of portrayal that we see. So um, when we first started hitting mainstream media, this was in 2017 during the bull run, wherein all of these celebrity ICO endorsements began. Um, and this was an interesting time because while it did shine a light on the space and get a lot of exposure and people involved, it wasn't the best way to do it yet. Um, there was, you know, obviously the ICOs, a lot of them were scams. There's a lot of issues with uh, regulation and the SEC when it comes to promoting securities online. Um, and it wasn't the best way, but it was the first stumble into how do we get this into a mainstream view. Now, the growth that we've seen from that point in time is television references, movie references, music references, in which there's mentions or uh, a quick a quick time that they show a uh, cryptocurrency wallet on screen. Um, and what this does is it gets the viewer to ask themselves, hey, what's that? Um, and that's really the phase that we're in. And a lot of people who have been in the space longer, who are very tech heavy type people, don't have the uh, availability to understand that we're still in the hey what's that phase um and yeah, it's a great way to put it yeah it's really important it's really important that we focus on that um and rachel what's been your greatest learning so far would you say in your current role as an entrepreneur in the crypto space my greatest learning um i i'm not sure that it has much more to do with uh the crypto space than it does the climate, you know? I, I, I've i never had a big social media page before crypto finally, you know? I had a Instagram profile with 200 followers for five years. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to get to like 400 followers uh, <laughs> and it being a really big deal. Um, So the entire, the entire thing has been a learning curve for me. You know, I'm not used to having thousands or hundreds of thousands of people seeing my content. I'm at the point where I'm getting uh, maybe 5 million impressions on a month on Twitter alone. Um, and it doesn't hit me. It doesn't hit me that these are real people. Uh, so that's, that's been something for me. And in the way that I am going about representing myself, um, you know, there's a lot of people watching. Uh, and I'm just not used to there being a lot of people watching. I've had people who show up at conferences uh, to meet me, several conferences. I actually, when I was at Blockchain Futurist, had an anonymous Twitter account send me a photo of myself that he had taken through a gate far away. I don't know who took the photo, but that's, it's really, things like this start to happen when you build a big platform. Um, and that for me, outside of just cryptocurrency, blockchain has been one of the larger learning curves. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, in people watching, you mean people are watching you essentially, like you're a celebrity. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't go that far, but, you know, people are aware of who I am. I've had several conversations with people at conferences that I didn't realize they knew who I was until mid-conversation. Um, 
I have people come up to me at conferences and tell me like they're the anonymous person who's been trolling me, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just like the community really is here. That internet community really is in real life, uh, but it doesn't always feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what does it mean to you think that you're, I don't know, are you a role model now because you're in this sort of inf- influencer status, I guess? I think that if people are using the word influencer and if people are calling themselves influencer, that they should be using their power for something good and larger um, than selling a product, than shilling an ICO, than something like that. You know, I feel like that word does come with a lot of power, so I don't use it easily. Um, But I think that what I'm doing in the space is just different. Uh, It's different from what the space has experienced in the past. Seems that way. Um, With that power, have you had opportunity? Are there opportunities that have come your way because you have, I would say, an influencer status in crypto Twitter? Um, You know, nothing revolutionary or life changing. Uh, But yeah, I I can go to conferences, you know, Um, I'm given speaking engagements. Uh, I have a platform to uh, relay this sort of information that I think is important to get out there. What are you enjoying the most just from your day to day digital nomad crypto life? Uh, The community. Absolutely the community. Um, Everywhere I go, I find a great community of people who more or less originated from Twitter, more or less originated (laughs) from the conferences, um, and just making new friends and getting to know new people in different places. I'm doing this podcast for a women in crypto series. So, you know, we've been talking about some of the aspects. Is there something else that you wanted to talk about? Um, You know, what does it mean to you to be a woman in crypto? I think it's important. Um, I think that because this is an emerging technology, we in the cryptocurrency and blockchain community finally have an opportunity to say, we're going to go about this differently. You know, this isn't going to be the next Bill Gates. It's not going to be the next Microsoft. Uh, We have the opportunity to say, hey, this is the ground floor and we can go into this inclusively. Um, And I think that that's one of the most important things that I stand for at this level and at this time is saying that if we enter this, the same demographic that has always entered a new technology, the same things are going to happen that have always happened. Uh, Because it's so new and it's happening right now in 2019, when people are more outspoken than they've ever been, when people are standing up for themselves and their rights, more than we have seen in the past. They're being more vocal. We have the internet as a means of uh, transmission and communication um, that it's important that we take advantage of it. uh, And it's important that we bring it to this new technology. You know, we don't have to just be the same demographic of people who understood tech in the beginning. We have the opportunity to be more, which is more than you can say for a lot of past emerging technologies. And I feel it's so important we take advantage of that. Hmm. Um, are there hurdles that that you think you've had to overcome because tech is a male dominated industry or crypto is a male dominated industry? I think the fact that the mass majority of crypto Twitter got caught on a tweet that I said that I am allowed to post bikini pictures and also be a speaker, um, would be indicative of the kinds of hurdles I'm experiencing, Hmm. you know? All I said was that I'm allowed to be both and everyone sort of lost their shit. (laughs) Um, And you know, it's funny on some level, but it's also sad. It's also really sad uh, that that's what everyone got so focused on that, you know, the next counter wave to it was making fun of the fact that I dress the way that I do. Um, It's, it's not going to get new people involved. Uh, you know, walk, walk into a conference, look around, and this is to the men who are in the space, look around the room and tell me if you see yourself. Because if you see yourself, the work to get you there is already done. Hmm. The question is, do you see people like me? Do you see people who are different from you? Um, and that really does need to be the focus. Yeah, it's really interesting. Do you think that it was other women who were mostly um, pissed off? Or, you know, is it women who are being competitive or angry that you're, I don't know. And what, where do you think most of the, I don't know, anger or this backlash was coming from? Um, you know, it came from both men and women. Um, what's interesting 
about the women who have the backlash. And this is, you know, commonly misconceived, but women can also not understand this. Women can also be a victim of this sort of mainstream media that controls us and the way that we view the world. Um, just because you live in a woman's body doesn't mean that you have not been conditioned to think this way, to have these beliefs. And so the fact that they are women doesn't necessarily remove them from the general category of people who think this way. That's interesting. Um, when it comes to the men who definitely existed in this uh, outpour and outrage, um, you know, it's just changing the way that you're thinking and understanding that the way that you walk through the world is not the same way that I walk through the world. Um, our steps are different. Our experiences are different. And if you can't live from this end of the experience, you shouldn't be on your end making fun of it. And what's um, the main, the sentiment? Is it like, you need to put a shirt on or what, like, what was the, what were you getting back? Um, that it doesn't belong. For the most part, I'm getting back that it does not belong here, that we right. have other things that belong here. This does not belong here. Right. Um, and I'm trying to open this door and say, you know, Bitcoin doesn't discriminate. Uh, everything belongs. Yeah. Crypto Twitter is a crazy place, right? It's, um, it's business, but it's also personal. I find like, you know, it's, um, it feel it, I, you know, when I was talking about what, what I felt comfortable posting or not posting because it felt very personal, let's say my photo of me water skiing or whatever it is, a bikini photo of me, um, it feels close to home, right? Whereas crypto Twitter, it has this funny, it's, it's blurring all the lines, I find. it's and As far as younger people go, um, the way that we perceive social media as a whole is different than other generations prior to us. You know, social media has existed my entire life. Since I was eight years old, I had a MySpace page. Um, and the way that we interpret public versus private, the lines have been blurred and they've been changed. Um, and just because a younger person views social media in a different way than the older generations might view social media doesn't mean it's wrong. It just, again, means that their experience has been different. Mm -hmm. um, and Rachel, have you had any Me Too moments or uh, moments where, um, you know, somebody was crossing a line, let's say? I mean, that's like hard to put your finger on, but for sure. Um, and that's part of what I'm doing with taking these stances as well is saying, you know, just cause we exist doesn't give you the rights to us. Um, and a lot of people haven't figured that out yet. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, yeah. What would you say to someone who's looking at you in a sexualized way when you're trying to put something out that's more neutral? I would say that your view and your perspective would be your view and your perspective, but becoming vocal, becoming violent, becoming nasty about it is where the line should really be drawn. You know, people are allowed to interpret things the way they have and the way they will based on their own experience. However, making a big fuss about it, um, attacking people is not good for anyone in any industry for any means. No, absolutely not. Um, what are your thoughts just on feminism? Cause so I'll just say one of the other sides might be, um, you know, old school feminists might say, um, yeah, but aren't you objectifying, aren't you creating a situation where your body is, or you're being objectified by, um, posing without your clothes on, let's say like wearing a bikini, but without that, full clothes. Uh, that is very hardcore first wave feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and what people need to remember is that the first wave of feminism uh, did not include many, many types of women. It did not include women of color. Um, it did not include sex workers. It did not include people who are taking this route. Now, what we're looking at now is intersectionality which is incredibly important. That's saying that women of all types, uh, LGBTQ communities, um, uh, people of color, they all need to be involved in the way that we view feminism. It cannot just be, hey, you guys are allowed to vote, so things are fair now, which was what first wave feminism was, um, which inherently is problematic. 
you know, saying that now we're we're allowed to vote, but we're still gonna view you the way that we are. We're still gonna have problems with these certain demographics, these certain communities who happen to be women um, is still extremely problematic. You know, there needs to be room to say, hey, everybody is included in this. Yeah, so what is this new wave of feminism and what are what should be our rights as women? We should be able to do whatever we want to do as human beings, you know? Um, it's no different than the way these men think that they can walk through the world. I mean, I don't think there's anything more offensive about me posting a bikini picture than about them retweeting it and saying nasty things about me, you know? My like it my my post inherently becomes less offensive than the response posts Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um is there anything else you wanted to chat about we could go down the road of facebook libra um or any other topics you wanted to get to um i anything you want (laughs) (laughs) um okay well i'll ask you just briefly what are your thoughts on facebook's libra coin um it's sort of the same thing that I feel about celebrity ICO endorsements, uh, which is that it shines a light on the space. It gets people involved. It gets people talking. However, it's not necessarily the thing that's going to save the space. It doesn't mean that that tech is going to be good for the space in the long run, um, but it does allow us exposure. You know, uh, Trump tweeted about the Libra coin, which is outrageous. Trump <laughs> tweeted like fuck Bitcoin and Bitcoin went up like $700 like that <laughs> right. day. Um, so it, it does go to show that we do act autonomously um, without this sort of governance. Um, but I don't think that the existence of Libra will make or break us as a community. Fantastic. Um, well, before you go, I have a couple of fun questions for you, if you don't mind. <laughs> Number one, if you could live and work in any city in the world for a year, even though you're already traveling the world, (laughs) where would you choose to go? Um, I'd probably leave the United States. Uh, Honestly, um, I love Europe. It's incredibly beautiful. Um, It's quiet and people are nicer. (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting. Um, Number two, if you were given 100 Bitcoins, what would you do with them? If I was given 100 Bitcoins, uh, what would I do with them? I would probably go get an RV somewhere and sit quietly (laughs) for a long time. Yeah. Um, Number three, who's someone dead or alive that you've looked up to at some point? Oh, man. You know what's really funny is, um, and I've been saying this a lot recently, are you familiar with Lizzo? No. Okay. Lizzo is, uh, she's a singer and she is fantastic. She is a big, heavy set African-American woman. And she sings about feminism. She sings about, you know, taking back our own sort of rights, believing in yourself, being who you want to be. She posts naked pictures all the time, all the time, despite the fact that her body might not necessarily conform to what we view as sexy in the world. Um, She is taking that back as her own right. Um, And uh, I think that it's amazing. I think that it's fantastic that we're in a place right now where we can just be proud of who we are and what it is that we do in the bodies that we live in. Um, And a lot of my responses uh, to especially the women who've been putting down what I have going on um, on Twitter would be, you know, we're, we're disappointing Lizzo. (laughs) (laughs) Sum it up with that. (laughs) That's funny. Um, no, it's great. Yeah. I think it's, you know, but you do raise a good point. Um, you know, that, that why not put ourselves out there? I think there's something to do with what's behind it, right? You seem to me like a strong female who is ready to just put yourself out there for who you are with all these facets and just say, take me or leave me, I am who I am. And and that to me sounds like feminism, just to have that strength of um, character and just your, like in terms of self-worth. If you are in love with yourself, like fuck the world if they can't deal with it. Yeah. And I mean, it's also important to remember um, that me posting selfies of myself is not what created the platform for this conversation. It was the backlash that created the platform for this conversation. Interesting. Yeah. Why is there that backlash? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, Number four, what's the best or worst advice someone's ever given you? Um, Any and all TA that I have heard. (laughs) 
<laughs> so you're not wealthy in Bitcoin, stat, you know, with your, all your crypto at this stage. <laughs> uh, number five, finish this sentence, if you will, please. One day there will be no more blank. God. I want to say, I want to say personal discrimination, but I, I'm, you know, at, at the rate that we're moving, I'm hoping that it can wash away as more young people uh, start growing into adults. Um, as we start taking control of the media that's in front of us and the way that we're viewing the world. Um, but I don't think there's anything set in stone that we can say there will be no more of that really does have to come from interpersonal levels and the way that we are exposed to the world, you know? It, we can say that the United States is a big uh, social, it's a social project. Um, you know, they're, they are putting all of this information in front of us and we are reacting to what we receive. Um, so I'm hoping that there will be a time when that's not the case, when the way that we live in the world is less reactionary and more proactive. Hmm. Well, before I let you go, I, you know, I was making an assumption that you being able to put yourself out there means that you really love yourself. Is, am I getting that right? Do you love what you're about and, and feel strongly, have like a strong sense of self-worth? I think that we all should. And I think that confidence, especially within yourself, is important in any industry, in any walk of life. Um, but that the people who are big on social media who post things like that, you cannot take that one second, will you, that one second snapshot of their life and say that you understand where they're coming from or that you understand what's going on with them on a personal level. Um, I think that there's lots of room and that people can both feel confident and self-love and also have hard days. Yeah, that's a great, great way to sum it up. Well, thanks so much, Rachel. It's been great chatting with you today. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Speaking of Crypto with Shannon. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit speakingofcrypto.com and Facebook and Twitter at Speaking Crypto. We'll catch you next time.